I thought the king had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. Well, it all seems very right. But now, in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most. For equalities are so weight that curiosity in neither can make choice of either's moiety. Is not this your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, has been at my charge. I have blushed so often to acknowledge him that now I am braced to it. I cannot conceive it. No, this young fellow's mother could. Whereupon she grew round wound, and had indeed set her son for her cradle ere she had her husband for her bed. <laughs> Dear smell of fault. I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have a son, sir, by order of law, some year elder than this, who is yet no dearer in my account. And this knave came somewhat saucily into the world before he was sent for. It was his mother fair. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 there was good sport at his making, and the horse must be acknowledged. Edmund, you know this noble gentleman? No, my lord. My lord of Kent. Remember him hereafter as my honourable friend. My services to your lordship. I must love you and see you to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. Mm. He has been out nine years, uh, and away he shall again. The king is coming. Attend the lords of France and Burgundy. Gloucester. Yes, I shall, my lord. Meantime, when we shall express a uh, darker purpose. Give me the map there. Know that we have divided in three uh, kingdoms. And tis our fast intent to shake all care and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we, unburdened, <coughs> crawl toward death. <laughs> As son of Cornwall and you, our no less loving son of Albany, we have this hour a constant will to publish our daughter's several dowers, that future strife may be prevented. Now, the princes France and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our courts have made their amorous sojourn, and here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both the rule, interest of territory, cares of state, which of you, shall we say, doth love us most? That we our largest bounty may extend when nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril, our eldest born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than words can wield the matter. Dearer than eyesight, space, and liberty. Beyond what can be valued, rich or rare, no less than life, with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as child e'er loved or father found. A love that makes breath poor and speech unable. Beyond all manner of so much, I love you. But shall Cordelia speak? Love and be silent. Of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and with champagnes, rich with plenteous rivers and wide-skirted meads, we make thee, lady, to thine and Albany's issue, be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest Regan, wife of Cornwall? I am made of that self-metal as my sister, and prize me at her worth. In my true heart I find she names my very deed of love, only she comes too short that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys that the most precious square of sense possesses, and find I am alone felicited in your dear Highness love. And poor Cordelia, and yet not so, since I am sure my love's more ponderous than my To thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample third of our fair kingdom, no less in space validity and pleasure than that conferred on Goneril. Ah, uh, our joy, although our last and least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interested. What can you say? To draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. 
Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more nor less. Ah, uh, Cordelia, men, just speak a little. Lest you may mar your fortunes. Good my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as a right fit. Obey you, love you, and most honour you. Why have my sister's husbands if they say they love you all? Happily when I shall wed, that lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him, half my care and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all. It goes thy heart with this. I, my good lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Thy truth, then, be thy dar. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, by all the operation of the orbs from whom we do exist, or cease to be, here I disclaim all my paternal care, propinquity, and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee from this forever. The barbarous Scythian, or he that makes his generation messes to gorge his appetite, shall to my bosom be as well neighbored, pitied, and relieved as thou, my sometime daughter. Good lady. Peace, Kent! Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most, and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. Out and avoid my sight. So in my grave, my peace. As here I give her father's heart from her. Call France, who stirs? Call Burgundy, Cornwall, and Albany. With my two daughters' dowers, digest the third. Let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power and preeminence and all the large effects that troop with majesty. Ourself, by monthly course, with reservation of an hundred nights by you to be sustained, shall our abode make with you by due terms. Only we will retain the name and all the addition of a king, the sway, revenue, execution of the rest, beloved sons, be yours. Wish to confirm this coronet part between you. Well, dear, whom I have ever honoured as my king, loved as my father, as my master, followed as my great patron, thought on in my The breath. bow is bent and drawn, make from the shaft. Well, fall rather, though the fork invade the region of my heart. Be Kent unmannerly when Lear is mad. <laughs> Must thou do, old man? Dost think that duty shall have dread to speak when power to flattery bows? To plainness honour's bound when majesty falls for folly. Preserve thy state, and in thy best consideration check thy hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment, thy youngest daughter does not love thee least. Nor are they empty-hearted whose low sounds reverb no hollowness. Kent, on thy life no more. My life I ever held but a pawn. To wage against thine enemies, nor fear to lose it, thy safety being motive. Out of my sight. See better, Lear, and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Now by Apollo, now by Apollo King, thou swearest thy gods in vain. Go fast, miscreant. Yes, Kill thy physician, and thy fee bestow upon the foul disease. Revoke thy gift. Hmm? While I can vent clamour from my throat, I'll tell thee thou dost evil. Hear me, recreant. On thine allegiance, hear me. As thou hast sought to make us break our vow, which we durst never yet, and by strained pride to come betwixt our sentence and our power, which nor our nature nor our place can bear, our potency made good, take thy reward. Five days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from disasters of the world, and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. If on the tenth day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominion, that moment is thy death. Away! By Jupiter, this shall not be revoked. Fare thee well, king, since thus thou wilt appear, freedom lives hence, and banishment is here. The gods to their dear shelter take thee, maid, that justly thinkst and hast most rightly said. And your large speeches may your deeds approve, that good effects may spring from words of love. Thus Kent, O oh princes, bids you all adieu. He'll shape his old course in a country of you. Yes, France and Burgundy, my noble lord. My lord of Burgundy, we first address toward you, who with this king have rivaled for our daughter. What in the least?
Will you require in present dower with her, or cease your quest of love? Most royal majesty, I crave no more than hath your highness offered. Nor will you tend her less. Right, noble Burgundy, when she was dear to us, we did hold her so, but now her price is all. So there she stands. If aught within that little seeming substance, or all of it, with our displeasure pieced. May fitly like your grace, she's there, and she is yours. I know no answer. Will you, with those infirmities she owes, unfriended, new adopted to our hate, dowered with our curse, and strangered with our oath, take her or leave her? Pardon me, royal sir, election makes not up on such conditions. Then leave her, sir, for by the power that made me, I tell you all her wealth. For you, great king, I would not from your love make such a stray to match you where I hate. Therefore beseech you to avert your liking a more worthier way than on a wretch whom nature is ashamed almost to acknowledge her. This is most strange. She, who even but now is your best object, the argument of your praise, balm of your age, the best, the dearest, should, in this trice of time, commit a thing so monstrous as to dismantle so many foes of fear. Mm -hmm. Sure, her defense must be of such unnatural degree that monsters it. <laughs> or your forevouched affection fall into taint, which, to believe of her, must be a faith that reason without miracle could never plant in me. I yet beseech your majesty, if for I want that glib and oily art to speak and purpose not, since what I well intend, I'll do it before I speak, that you make known it is no vicious blot, murder or foulness, no unchaste action or dishonored step that hath deprived me of your grace and favor. But even for want of that for which I am richer, a still soliciting eye and such a tongue that I am glad I have not, though not to have it hath lost me in your liking. Better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me, better. There is Cordelia. Thou art most rich being poor, most choice forsaken, and most loved, despised. Thee and thy virtues here I seize upon. Be lawful, I take up what's cast away. Thou hast her, France, let her be thine, for we have no such daughter. Nor shall ever see that face of hers again. Therefore be gone, without our love, our grace, our benison. Be farewell to your sister. jewels of our father. With washed eyes, Cordelia leaves you. I know you what you are, and like a sister, I'm most loath to call your faults as they are named. Love well, our father. Your professed bosoms I commit him, and yet, alas, stood I within his grace, I would prefer him to a better place. So farewell to you both. Prescribe not us our duty. Let your study be to content your lord, who has received you at fortune's arms. You have obedience canted, and well are worth the want that you have wanted. Time shall unfold what plighted cunning hides, who covered faults at last with shame derides. Well may you prosper. Come, my fair queen. Sister, it is not little I have to say of what most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence tonight. That's most certain. And with you. Next month with us. You see how full of changes his age is. The observation we have made of it has not been little. He always loved our sister most. And with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly. Tis the infirmity of his age. Yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. The best and soundest of his time hath been but rash. Then must we look to receive from his age, not alone the imperfections of long engraft condition, but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years bring with them. Such inconstant starts are we likely to have of him of this of Ken's banishment. There is further compliment of leave-taking between France and him. Pray you, let us hit together. If our father carry authority with such disposition as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall think further of it. We must do something, and in the heat.
bow, nature art my goddess. To thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom, and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me, for that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines, lag of a brother? Why, bastard, wherefore base, when my dimensions are as well compact, and my mind as generous, and my shape as true as honest madam's issue? Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base? Who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed go to the creating a whole tribe of fops got tween asleep and wake? Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now, gods, stand up for bastards. Edmund, now, now. what news? So please, your lordship, none. I seek you so earnestly to put up that letter. I know no news, my lord. What paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No. What needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath not such need to hide itself. Now come, let's see. If it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. <laughs> I do beseech your lordship, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read, and for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your or looking. Now give me the letter. I shall offend either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Oh, come, let's see, let's see. I hope for my brother's justification he wrote this but as an essay or mm. taste of my virtue. <sighs> I find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of age tyranny which sways not as it has power but as it is suffered. Come to me that of this I may speak more. If our, fa if our father would sleep till I wake him, you should enjoy half his revenue forever. And live the beloved of your brother, Edgar. My son, Edgar. Had, had he the hand to write this? Do, do you know the characters to be your brothers? Well, has he never before spoken to you on this business? Never, my lord. But I've oft heard him maintain it to be fit that sons at perfect age and fathers decline. The father should be as war to the son, and the son manage his revenue. Villain, his very opinion in the letter. A horrid villain, a natural, detested British villain. Worse than British. Go, sir, and seek him out. I'll apprehend him. Abominable villain. No, oh, he cannot be such a monster. To his father that so tenderly and entirely loves him. Nor is not sure. Mm. Great eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. Find out the villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. But do it carefully. The noble and true hearted Kent banished. His offense? <laughs> Honesty. Ah, oh, this train. This is the excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeits of our own behaviour, we make guilty of our disasters the sun, the moon and the stars, as if we were villains on necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves and treachers by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars and adulterers by an enforced obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting on. An admirable evasion of poor master man to lay his goatish disposition to the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows I am rough and lecherous. Ha! <laughs> I should have been that I am had the maidenliest star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. Edgar. And Patty comes, like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy with a sigh like Tom of Bedlam. Oh, these eclipses should portend these divisions. Oh, sorry. Oh, now, Brother Edmund, what serious contemplation are you in? 
I am thinking, brother, of a prediction I heard this other day, of what should follow these eclipses. How long have you been a sectary astronomical? When saw you my father last? The night gone by. Spake you with him? Aye, two hours together. Found you no displeasure in him by word nor countenance? No, none at all. Well, bethink yourself within, you may have offended him. And at my entreaty, forbear his presence until some little time hath qualified the heat of his displeasure, which at this instant so rageth in him, that even with the mischief of your person it would scarcely allay. <laughs> some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you have a confident forbearance till the speed of his rage goes slower. I pray you, go. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Armed, brother? Brother, I advise you to the best. I am no honest man if there be any good meaning towards you. I've told you what I've seen and heard, but faintly. Nothing like the image and horror of it. I pray you away. Shall I hear from you or not? I do serve you in this business. My father strike my gentleman for chiding of his fool. Aye, madam. By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he lashes into some gross crime or other that sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. His nights grow riotous. Himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak with him. Say I am sick. If you come slack of former services, you shall do well. The fault of it, I'll answer. He is coming, madam. I hear him. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. I'd have it come to question. If he distaste it, let him to my sister, whose mind and mine in that I know are one, not to be overruled. Idle old man, that still would manage those authorities that he had given away, now by my life. Oh, fools are babes again. And must be used with checks, as flatterers when they are seen abused. Remember what I have said? Well, madam. And let his knights have colder looks among you, what grows of it no matter, advise your fellow so. I would read from hence occasions, and I shall, that I may speak. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my very course. Prepare for dinner. If but as well I other accents borrow that can my speech defuse, my good intent may carry through itself to that full purpose for which I raised my likeness. Now, banished Kent, if thou canst serve where thou dost stand condemned, so it may come thy master whom thou lovest shall find thee full of labours. Oh, let me not stay and drop for dinner. <coughs> Go, get it ready. Hello, <coughs> what art thou? A man, sir? What dost thou profess? What wouldst thou with us? I do profess to be no less than I seem. To serve him truly that will put me in trust, to love him that is honest, to converse with him that is wise and says little, and to fear judgment, to fight when he cannot choose, and to eat no fish. <coughs> what art thou? Very honest-hearted fellow, sir, and as poor as the king. <laughs> if thou beest as poor for a subject as he is for a king, thou art poor enough. <coughs> what wouldst thou? Service. Who wouldst thou serve? You. Dost thou know me, fellow? No, sir, but you have that in your countenance that I'd fain call master. What's that? Authority. <coughs> Follow me, thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I shall not part from thee yet. Dinner! Oh, oh, oh. Dinner! Ah, you, sinner, where's my daughter? Sir, please, your... Uh, you, sir, you! Come you hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father. My lady's father? My lord's name. You horsen duck. You shred it, you... I am none of these things, my lord. I beseech your pardon. Do you bandy looks with me, you rascal? I will not be struck in, my lord. <laughs> not trip neither, you base football player. <laughs> ah, I thank thee. Thou serves me and I love thee. Come, <laughs> sir, arise, away. I'll teach you differences. Ah. Away. <laughs> if you measure your lover's length again, tarry. But away. <laughs> Go to, have you, wisdom? <laughs> so... My friend in name, I thank thee. There's earnest to thy service. Let me go ah, and you. There's my coxcomb. Yeah. Well, my pretty name, how dost thou? You were best take my coxcomb. Why, fool? Why? For taking one's part the doubt of favour, nay, and thou canst not smile as the wind sits, they'll catch cold shortly. Take my coxcomb. Why, this fellow, he's banished to one's daughters and did the third of blessing against his will. If you follow him, you must needs wear my coxcomb. 
How now, Uncle? Mm. Would I have two coxcombs and two daughters? My boy. If I gave them all me living, I'd keep me coxcombs myself. There's mine. Take another of thy daughters. Take heed, sir. The whipped. Oh, truth's a dog, Master Kennel. He must be whipped out while the Lady Brack may stand by the fire and stink. <laughs> a pestilent gall to me. Sir, huh? I'll teach thee a speech. <laughs> Do, boy. Now mark it, Uncle. Mm. Have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest, mm. lend less than thou owest, ride mm. more than thou goest, learn <laughs> more than thou trowest, set less than thou throwest. Leave thy drink and thy oar, and keep in a door, <laughs> and thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. This is nothing, fool. Then tis like the breath of an unfee lawyer, you gave me nothing for it. <laughs> can you make no use of nothing, Uncle? Oh, I know, boy, nothing can be made out of nothing. Oh, prithee, tell him. Oh. So much the rent of his land comes to, he'll not believe a fool. A bitter fool. What, just know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet one? No, boy. Teach me. Then, Lord, that counsel thee to give away thy land, come place it me by me, and do thou for him stand. The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear. The one in Motley here, the other found out there. Dost thou call me fool, boy? All thy other titles thou hast given away. That thou wast born with. This is not altogether fool, my lord. Oh, <laughs> Hannah, uh, daughter. What makes that front lid on? Methinks you're too much a lady to frown. <laughs> Not only, sir, this your all licensed fool, huh? but other of your insolent retinue to hourly carp and quarrel, breaking forth in rank and not to be endured oh, oh. riots. Sir, I had thought by making this well known unto you to have found a safe redress, but now grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoken done oh. that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance. I know not for the edge sparrow fed the cuckoo so long he'd had it dead bit off by its young, so out went the candle, and we were left darkly. Are you? Our daughter. I would you would make use of that good wisdom whereof I know you are fraught, and put away these dispositions which of late transport you from what you rightly are. Me, not the ass. No one a cart draws the horse. Whoop! Jack, I love you. Does any here know me? This is not Leah. Who is it that can tell me who I am? Leah's shadow. Yeah, I would learn that, for by the marks of sovereignty, reason, and knowledge, I should be false persuaded I had daughters. Which they will make an obedient father. Your name, fair gentlewoman. <laughs> This admiration, sir, is much in the savour of other of your new pranks. I do beseech you to understand my purposes aright. Oh. As you are old and reverend, should be wise. Here do you keep an hundred knights and squires, <laughs> men so disordered, so debauched and bold, that this our court, infected with their manners, shows like a riotous inn. Epicurism and lust make it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. The shame itself would speak of instant remedy. <laughs> Be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs, a little to disquantity your train, and the remainder that shall still depend to be such men as may besort your age, which know themselves and you. Darkness and devil, saddle my horses, call my train together. Degenerate bastard, I'll not trouble thee, yet have I left a daughter. You strike my people, and your disordered rabble make servants of their betters. Oh, the too late repents. Oh, sir, are you come? Is it your will? Speak, sir, prepare my horses. Ingratitude. A marble-hearted fiend, more hideous when thou show'st thee in a child than the sea monster. Pray, sir, be patient. Detested kite, thou liest. My train are men of choice and rarest part, who all particulars of duty know, and with the most exact regard support the worship of their name. Oh, oh small for how ugly didst thou in Cordelia show, which, like an engine, wrenched my frame of nature from the fixed place, drew from my heart all love, and added to the gall. Oh, Leah, 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 beat at this gate that let thy folly in. And thy dear judgment out. Go, go, my people! Oh, my lord, I'm guiltless, as I'm ignorant of what they It may be so, my lord. Here, nature, here, dear goddess, here. Suspend thy purpose, if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in her the organs of increase. And from her delicate body never spring a babe to honor. If she must teem, create her child of spleen, that it may live and be athwart this nature torment her. Let it plant wrinkles in her brow of youth with cadent tears, fret channels in her cheeks, turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt that she may feel. How sharper than her serpent's 
truth it is to have a thankless child. Away! Away! Gods that we adore, whereof comes I tell thee! Life and death, I am ashamed that thou hast power to shake my manhood thus. But these hot tears that break from me for force should make thee worth them. Blast and fogs upon thee. The untented woundings of a father's curse pierce every sense about thee. Old fond eyes, but weep this cause again. I'll pluck ye out and cast you in the waters that you lose to temper clay. <laughs> Is it come to this? Let it be so. I have another daughter who I am sure is kind and comfortable. When she shall hear this of thee, with her nails she'll flay thy wolvish visage. Thou shalt see that I'll resume the shape which thou dost think I have cast off forever. Do you mark that, my lord? Are you content? What Oswald, how? Oh. You, sir, more knave than fool, after your master. Uncle, here, carry to take the fool with thee. How now, Oswald? What have you writ that letter to my sister? Aye, madam. Take you some company and away to horse. Inform her full of my particular fear, and thereto add such reasons of your own as may compact it more. Get you gone, and hasten your return. Oh, well. The event. Go you before to my Lady Regan with these letters. Acquaint her no further with anything you know than comes from her demand out of the letter. If your diligence be not speedy, I shall be there before you. I will not sleep, my lord, till I've delivered your letter. If a no. man's brains were in his eaves, were not in danger of kibes, no, well Lord. then prithee be merry, thy wit shall not go slipshod. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> shall see, thy other daughter will use thee kindly, for though she's as like this as a crab's like an apple, you know, I can tell what I can tell. What can tell? She will taste as like this as a crab does to a crab. Mm. Can't tell why one's nose stands in the middle of his face. No. To keep his eyes on either side of his nose, that what a man may, cannot smell out, he may spy into. I did her wrong. Can you tell how an oyster makes his shirt? No, 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 I neither. But I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Put his head in. Mm. Not to give away to his daughters and leave his horns without a case. Shall forget my nature. So kind of father. Be my horses ready. Thy ashes have gone about them. The, the reason why the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason. Because they're not eight. Yes, indeed. Thou wouldst make a good fool to take to again perforce. Monster in gratitude. If thou wert my fool, Uncle, I'd have thee beaten for being old before huh? thy time. How's that? Thou shouldst not have been old until thou hadst been wise. Oh, let me not be mad. Not mad. Sweet heaven, keep me in. I would not be mad. Come, boy. She that's a maid now and laughs at my departure shall not be a maid long. And this thing be cut shorter. I heard myself proclaimed. By the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No pause is free, no place that guard, and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Whilst I may escape, I will preserve myself. And am bethought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury in contempt of man brought near to beast. My face I'll brine with filth, blanket my loins, elf all my hairs in knots, and with presented nakedness outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars, who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified bare arms, pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary. And with this horrible object, low farms, poor pelting villages, sheep coats, mills, Sometimes with lunatic bands, sometimes with prayers. Enforce their charity. Poor Turley God. Poor Tom. 
of something yet. Edgar, I'm nothing. Um, Good dawning to thee, friend. Out of this house? Aye. Where may we set our horses? In the mire. Prithee, if thou lust me, tell me. No, I love thee not. Why then? I care not for thee. If I had thee in Lipsbury Pinfold, I'd make thee care for me. Why do you use me thus? I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base, proud, beggarly, three-suited, hundred-pound, filthy, worsted, stocking knave. <laughs> A lily-livered, action-taking, horse and glass-gazing, super-serviceable, finical rogue. A one-trunk inheriting slave. One that wouldst be a bored by way of good service. And art nothing but the combination of a knave, beggar, coward, pander, and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch. One which I shall beat into a clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. Why? Monstrous fellow art thou to rail on one that is neither known of thee nor knows thee. What a brazen-faced varlet art thou to deny thou knowest me, hmm? Is it two days since I tripped thee up by the heels and beat thee before the king? Come draw thy sword, for though it be night, yet the moon shines. Come on, I'll make a sop of the moonshine of you. Yeah, horse and cullion thee, barbermonger. Draw! Away, I'll have nothing to do with thee. Draw, you rascal! Help! Ho! Oh, murder! Help! Strike, you slave! Stand, rogue, stand! Help! You need slave! Strike! Help! Ho! Oh, murder! Help! Oh, weapons, arms, and what is the matter here? Keep peace upon your lives! He dies that strikes again. What was the offence you gave him? I never gave him any. Fetch forth the stocks! You stubborn ancient neggy! Reverend braggart, we'll teach you. Sir, I'm too old to learn. Call not your stocks for me. I serve the king, on whose employment I was sent to you. You shall do small respect, show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master, stocking his messenger. Fetch forth the stocks. As I have life and honor here, shall he sit till noon? Till noon. Till night, my lord. And all night, too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you would not use me so? Serving his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the self-same colour our sisters speak so. Come, bring away the stocks. It will be beseech your grace not to do so. And his fault is, but and the good king his master will take him for it. Your purpose, no correction, is such as basest and condemnest wretches for pilferings and most common trespasses are punished with. The king must take it ill. That he so slightly valued in his better should have him thus restrained? I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse to have a gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs. Put in his legs. Come, my lord, away. I'm sorry for thee, friend. It is the Duke's pleasure whose disposition all the world well knows will not be rubbed nor stopped. Huh? I entreat for thee. Pray you, do not, sir. I've watched and travelled hard. Sometime I shall sleep out, the rest I'll whistle. A good man's fortune may grow out at heels. Give you good morrow. The Duke's to blame for this. Uh, it'll be you taken. Great king that dost approve the common saw, thou out of heaven's benediction comest to the warm sun. Approach thou beacon to this under globe, that by thy comfortable beams I may peruse this letter. Nothing almost sees miracles but misery. I notice from Cordelia, who hath most happily been informed of my obscured course, and shall find time from this enormous state, seeking to give losses their remedy. All weary and all watched. Take vantage, heavy eyes, not to behold thy shameful lodging. Fortune, good night. Smile once more. Turn thy wheel.
Tis strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. Hail to thee, noble master. Ah, makes thou this shame thy pastime. Oh, my good lord. Hey, well, cruel garters. Horses are tied by the head, dogs and bears by the neck, monkeys by the loins, men by the legs. When a man's over the dead legs, he wears wooden nether stocks. What's he that has so far thy place mistook to set thee here? It's both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say, yes. No, no, they would not. Yes, they have. By Jupiter, I swear no. By Juno, I swear I. They durst not do it. They would not, could not do it. Tis worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage. Winter's not gone yet if the wild geese fly that way. Oh, this mother swells up toward my heart. Hysterica passio. Down. Climbing sorrow, the elements below. Where is this daughter? With the earl, sir, here within. Follow me not, stay here. How chance the king comes with so small a number? And thou hast been setting the stocks for that question, that's well deserved it. Why, fool? We sent thee to school to an ant, to teach thee there's no labouring in the winter. All that follow them noses are led by their eyes. But blind men, and there's not a nose among twenty but can smell him that's stinking. Let go thy hold when a great wee runs down, or he'll lest it break thy neck with following. But the great one that goes upward, let him draw thee after. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, let me have mine again. I'd have none but knaves follow it since a fool gives it. Well, learned you this, fool. Not either stocks, fool. Tonight to speak with me, they are sick, they are weary, they travel all the night, mere fetches. Aye, the images of revolt and flying off, fetch me a better answer. My dear Lord, you know the fiery quality of the Duke. How unremovable and fixed he is in his own court. Vengeance, plague, death, confusion, fiery, what quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester, I would speak with the Duke of Cornwall oh, and I, his wife. I have informed them informed so much. Informed them? Dost understand me, man? Aye, my Lord. The King would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak commands. Ten service, are they informed of this? My breath and blood fiery, the fiery duke, tell the hot duke that... No. No, not yet. Maybe he is not well. Infirmity doth still neglect all office, where to our health is bound. We are not ourselves. When nature being oppressed commands the mind to suffer with the body, I'll forbear. And I'm fallen out with my more headier will to take the indisposed and sickly fit for the sound man. Death on my stick! Wherefore should he sit here? This act persuades me that this remotion of the Duke and her is practice only. Give me my servant forth! Go. Tell the Duke and his wife I'd speak with them now, presently. Bid them come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum till it cries sleep to death. I would have all well be oh, me, my heart, my rising hearts, are down. Cry to it, my uncle, as the cock needed to the ills when she put him in a paste alive. She napped him on a coxcomb with a stick and down, you wanton, down! It was her brother that in pure kindness to his horse butted his hay. Good morrow, you both. Hail to your grace. I'm glad to see your highness. Greek. I think you are. I know what reason I have to think so. If thou shouldst not be glad, I would divorce me from thy mother's tomb, sepulchring and adulterous. Ah, oh, you free. Some other time for that. Beloved Regan, my sister's not. Oh, Regan. She have tied sharp tooth unkindness like a vulture here. I can scarce speak with thee. Now thou not believe with how depraved a quality. Oh, Marie. I pray you, sir, take patience. I have hope you less know how to value her desert than she to scant her duty. So how is that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail in her obligation. <laughs> if, sir, perchance she hath restrained the riots of your followers, it is on such ground and such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. And my curse is on her. Oh, sir, you are old. <laughs> Nature in you stands on the very verge of her confine. You should be ruled and led by a discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore, I pray you, that to my sister you do make return, <laughs> say you have wronged her. Ask her forgiveness? <laughs> do you but mark how this becomes the house? 
Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. On my knees, I beg that you'll vouchsafe me Raymond Bennett. Good sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Never, Regan. She hath abated me of half my train. Looked black upon me, struck me with her tongue, most serpent-like about the very heart. All the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her ingrateful top. Strike her young bones, you taking airs with lame. Why, sir, fie! Dark lightnings, dart your blinding flames into her scornful eyes. Infect her beauty, you fens up fogs, drawn by the powerful sun to fall and blister. Oh, the blessed God, so will wish on me when the rash moves no, is on. Regan, thou shalt never have our curse. Thy tender hefted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness. Her eyes are fierce, but thine do comfort and not burn. It is not in thee to grudge my precious, to cut off my train, to ban me hasty words, to scant my sizes, and in conclusion to oppose the bolt against my coming in. Oh, well, thou better knowest the offices of nature. Bond of childhood, effects of courtesy, dues of gratitude. Thy half of the kingdom has thou not forgot, wherein I thee endowed. Good sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? What comforts there? It is my sister's. This approves her letter. She would soon be here. Is your lady come? This is a slave whose easy borrowed pride dwells in the fickle grace of her. He follows. I'll bar it from my sight. What means your grace? Who stopped my servant? Regan, I have good hope thou did not know aunt. Who comes here? <laughs> oh, heavens. If you do love old men. If your sweet sway allow obedience. If you yourselves are old. Make it your cause. Send down and take my part. Art not ashamed to look upon this beard or Regan? Wilt thou take her by the hand? <gasps> Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? Or is not offence that indiscretion finds and dotage terms so? Oh, sides, you are too tough. Will you get hold? How came my man in the stocks? I set him there, sir. But his own disorders deserve much less advancement. You did you? I pray you, father, being weak, seem so. If till the expiration of a month you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home, and out of that provision which will be needful for your entertainment. Return to her and fifty men dismissed? No. Rather, I abjure all roofs and seek to wage against the enmity of the air, to be a comrade with the wolf and owl. Necessity's sharp itch. Return with her? Why? The hot-blooded France who dourless took our youngest born. I could as soon be brought to knee his throne and squire like pension beg to keep base life afoot. Return with her! Persuade me rather to be slave and something to that detested groom. At your choice, sir. Oh, prithee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We'll no more speak, no more see one another. Yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter. Or rather, a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, an infected carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee. Let shame come when it will. I do not call it. I do not bid the thunder bearer shoot, nor tell tales of thee to high judging Jove. Mend when thou canst. Be better at thy leisure. I can stay with Regan. <sighs> I am my hundred knight. Not altogether so. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister. For those that must mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old. And so... But she knows what she does. Is this well said? I dare about it, so what fifty followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more, yea, or so many? Mm. Sith for both charge and danger speak against so great a number, how in one household should many people under two commands hold amity? Tis hard. Almost impossible. Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants, or from mine? Mm, then if they chance to slack ye, we could control them. If you will come to me, nay, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place and notice. I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositories, but kept a reservation to be followed by such a number. What? Must I come to you with five and twenty? Regan, send you so. And speak again, my lord, no more with me. Those wicked creatures, yet to look well favoured when others are more wicked, not being worst, stands in some rank of praise. I'll go with thee. 
Thy fifty, it doth double five and twenty. And thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty? Ten or five to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? What need one? Oh. Reason, not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady, if only to go warm or gorgeous, why nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, but scarcely keeps thee warm. But for true need, you heavens, give me patience, patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger. And let not women's weapons, water drops, stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags! I will have such revenges on you both as all the world shall... I shall do such things! What they are yet I know not, that they shall be the terrors of the earth! You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping. But this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws, or ere I'll weep. Oh, fool. I shall go mad. <sighs> Let us withdraw. It will be a storm. This house is little. The old man and his followers cannot be well bestowed. Tis his own blame, hath put himself from rest, and must needs taste his folly. For his particular, I'll receive him gladly. But not one follower, so am I purposed. Where is my lord of Gloucester? Follow the old man for. Ah, he's returned. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? <laughs> All stores, but will I know not whither? It's best to give him way. He leads himself. My lord, entreat him by no means to stay. Alack, the night comes on. The bleak winds do sorely ruffle. For many miles around there's scarce a bush. Oh, sir, to willful men, the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors. He is attended by a desperate train. And what they may incense him to, being apt to have his ear abused, wisdom bids fear. Shut up your doors, my lord. There's a wild night. My Regan counsels well. Come out of the storm. against a head so old and white as this. Oh, tis foul! He that has a 
has to put it in. It has a good end piece. I will be the pattern of all patience. I will say nothing. Grace in a codpiece, that's a wise man and a fool. Alas, sir, are you here? Think we got night, not not such nights as these. The wrathful skies gather the very wanderers of the dark and make them keep their caves. Since I was born, such seats of fire, such bursts of horrid thunder, such groans of roaring wind and rain, I never remember to have heard. Man's nature cannot carry the affliction nor the fear. The great gods that keep this dreadful puddle on our heads find out their enemies now. They tremble our rich. Thou hast within thee undivulging crimes, unquitted of justice. I thee, thou bloody hand, thou perjure, and thou similar virtue that art incestual. Caitiff to pieces shake. But under covert and convenient seeming, have practiced on man's life. Close pent up guilts, rive your concealing continents and cry these dreadful summoners' graves. I am a man more sinned against than sinning! Back, headed! Gracious, my lord! Hard by here is a hovel! Some friendship may it lend you against the tempest! Repose you there! Wits begin to turn. <laughs> Come on, my boy. How does my boy? Out cold. I'm cold, my son. Where is this straw fellow? The art of our necessities is strange. It can make vile things precious. Come. I have one part in my heart that's sorry yet for thee. Hey, the path and a little tiny wit will oh, the wind and the rain was made content with his fortune fit for the rainy pain every day. True, boy. Come. Bring us to your hovel. Here is the place, my lord. Let me alone. But my lord, enter. Will break my heart, my brother. Break my own. But my lord, enter. Thou thinks tis much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin. So tis to thee. But where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarce fell. Thou'd shun a bear, but if thy flag lay toward the roaring sea, thou'd meet the bear in the mouth. And the mind's free, the body's delicate. This tempest in my mind does from my senses take all feeling and say what beats there. Filial ingratitude. Is it not as this mouth would tear this hand for lifting food to it? But I will punish home. No, oh, I will weep no more. In such a night to shut me up. Pour on, I will endure. In such a night as this. Oh, Regan Connor, your old kind father, whose frank heart gave all. No, oh, that way madness lies. Let me shun that. No more of that. Good my lord, enter here. Prithee, go in thyself. Seek thine own ease. This tempest will not give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more. But I'll go in. In. Boy. Go first. You houseless poverty. Hmm. May I get the end? I'll pray. And I'll sleep. Poor naked wretches. Wheresoever you are. Abide the pelting of this bitterness storm. How could your houseless heads, your unfed 
inside. Your loot and window raggedness defend you from seasons such as these. Ah, uh, I have ten to little care of this. Take physic, pump. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel. The dummies shake the superflux to them. And show the heavens, just. Huh? Oh, come on in! It's the spirit! Help me! Help Give me, me a hand! Who's that? It's the spirit! It's the spirit! He said his name! Poor Tom! What art thou that dost grumble there in the straw? Come forth! Away! The foul fiend follows me! The sharp hawthorn blows the wind. Huh? Get to thy bed and warm thee. Didst thou give all to thy daughters? And i come to this. Who gives anything to poor Tom, whom the foul fiend hath led through fire and through flame, through ford and whirlpool, or bog and bog man, that lay knives under his pillow and halters in his pew and rats pain in his porridge store. Bless thy five wits. Oh, Tom's a cold. Bless thee from whirlwinds, star blasting, and take. No! Poor Tom's and jealousy, and the foul fiend vexes you. Where could I have him now? And there again, what? And there! Has his daughters brought him to this pass? Couldst thou save nothing, wouldst thou give them all? Now he reserved a blanket, else it would have been all shame. Now all the plagues that in the pendulant air hang fated on men's faults light on thy daughters. He hath no daughters. Oh, death traitor. <laughs> nothing could have subdued nature to such a loneliness but his unkind daughters. Is it the fashion for discarded fathers to show thus little mercy on their flesh? <laughs> Judicious punishment. It was this flesh that got those pelican daughters. Pelican sat on Pelican Hill. Pelican Hill. Cold night will turn us all to fools and madmen. I'm thinking of the foul thing. Mm. Yeah. Obey thy parents. Commit not with another man's sworn spouse. Set not thy sweetheart on proud array. Oh, it comes again. What hast thou been? A serving man, proud in heart and mind, that curled my hair and wore gloves in my cap, I served the lust of my mistress' heart, and did the act of darkness with wine, loved I deeply, dice dearly, and in woman, out paramour the church. Ah, keep thy foot out of brothels, thy hand out of pluckets, thy pen out of Linda's books, and beware of the foul fiend. Still through the fourth blows the sharp wind, says, so one, hey, no, no, me. Elfie, my boy. Why, Cessa, let him trot by. Mm. Thou wert better in a grave than to answer with thy uncovered body this extremity of the skies. Mm. Is man no more than this? Consider him well. Thou owest the worm no silk, the beast no hide. The sheep no wool, say the cat no perfume. <laughs> Here's three arms are sophisticated. Thou art the thing itself. An accommodated man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou. Off! Off! You lendings! Come, unbutton here! Pretty, thou shall be content! Give the naughty night to swim in. A little fire in a wild field were like an old lecher's heart. One small spark, the rest on body, cold. Look, look, look! Here comes a walking fire! This is the foul flippage of it. He begins at curfew and walks till the first cock mildews the white feet and hurts the poor creature of earth. How fares your grace? What's he? Who's there? What is to you see? Where are you there? Your name? <laughs> poor Tom! That in the fury of his heart, when the foul fiend rages, eats cow dung for salads. Ah, beware, my father! Peace! Smoke in peace, thou fiend! Oh, what at your grace, no better company! The prince of darkness is a gentleman. Modo, he's called, and Mahu! Our flesh and blood, my lord, is grown so vile that it doth hate what gets it. Tom's a call now. go in with me. My duty cannot suffer to obey in all your daughter's hard commands. Though their injunction be to bar my doors and let this tyrannous night take hold on you, yet I have ventured to come seek you out and bring you where both fire and food is ready. Uh, first, let me talk with this philosopher. 
What is the cause of thunder? Good, my lord. Take his offer and go into I'll the talk house. a word with this same learned Theban. What is your study? How to prevent the fiend and to kill them? Let me ask you one word in private. Importune him once more to go, my lord. His wits begin to unsettle. Canst thou blame him? His daughters seek his death. Thou says the king goes mad, I'll tell thee, friend, I'm almost mad myself. I had a son now I brought from my blood. He sought my life, but lately, very late. Truth to tell, the grief has crazed my wits. Oh, what a night is this. Oh, I do beseech your oh, grace. Oh, your mercy. <laughs> Noble philosopher. Your company. Oh, Tom's a cold. Ah. In fellow here, into the hovel. No, let's in, let's in all. Uh, this way, my lord. Yeah, with him. I will keep still with my philosopher. Good, my lord, shoot him. Let him take the fellow. Take him, you on. Yes, sir, come on, go along with us. Come. <laughs> Good Athenian. Nah, no words, no words. Ah, child, Roland to the dark tower came. His word was still by foe and fun. I smell the blood of the British. I now perceive it was not altogether your brother's evil disposition made him seek his death, but a provoking merit set a work by a reprovable badness in himself. How malicious is my fortune that I must repent to be just. This is the letter he spoke of, which approves him an intelligent party to the advantages of France. Go with me to the Duchess. If the matter of this paper be certain, you have mighty business in hand. True or false, it hath made thee Earl of Gloucester. Seek out where thy father is, that he may be ready for our apprehension. If I find my father comforting the king, it will stuff his suspicion more fully. I will persevere in my cause of loyalty, that the conflict be sore between that and my blood. I will lay trust upon thee. And thou shalt find a dearer father in my love. Here is better than the open air. Take it thankfully. Peace out the comfort with what addition I can. I will not be long from thee. All the power of his wits have given way to his impatience. God reward your kindness. Fatoretto calls me. Tells me Nero was an angler in the lake of darkness. Pray, innocent, and beware the foul fiend. Mm -hmm. Prithee, uncle, tell me if the madman be a yeoman or a gentleman. A king. A king. He's a yeoman that has a gentleman to his son, for he's a mad yeoman that sees his son a gentleman before him. He's to have a thousand with red burning spits come hissing in upon him. Foul fiend bites my back. He's mad to trust in the tameness of a wolf, a horse's health, a boy's love, or a whore's oath. <clears throat> it shall be done. <clears throat> I will arraign them straight. <clears throat> sit thou here, most learned justice of that. Sapient, sir, <clears throat> sit here. <clears throat> now, you she foxes. <laughs> Look how he stands and stares. Once thou eyes a trial, madam. <gasps> Come on, the born Bessie, mm. to me. Her boat hath a leak, and she cannot speak. Why, she dare not come over to thee. Foul thing haunts poor Tom in the voice of a nightingale. Uh, hoppy dance calls in my belly for two white herrings. Croak the black angel, I've no food for thee. How do you say? Will you lie down and rest upon the cushions? <laughs> yes, I'll see their trial first, bring in their evidence. <laughs> now, robed man of justice, take thy place. Now, this <clears throat> yoke fellow of equity, bench by his side. <laughs> well, you're of the commission. <laughs> Sit you too. Let us deal justly. <laughs> Arraign her first. Tis gone, Rim. I'm here to take my oath before this honourable assembly she kicked the poor king, her father. Come here, the mistress. Is your name Goneril? She cannot deny it. I'll cry your mercy. I took you for a joint stool. Mm -hmm. And there's another. Those warped looks proclaim what store her heart is made of. <laughs> Stop her there! Arms, arms, sword, fire! Corruption in the place! False justice! Her white is thou let her escape! Bless thy five wits. <laughs> Sir, where is the patience now that you so oft have boasted to retain? My tears uh, begin to take his part so much they mar my counterfeiting. Uh, 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 the little dogs and all. Trey, Blanche, and Sweetheart. See, they bark at me. Uh, Tom will throw his head at them. Uh, avaunt, you curse. Then let them anatomize, Regan. 
<clears throat> See what breeds a better heart. <clears throat> Is there any cause in nature that make these hard hearts? Hey, you, sir, I entertain for one of my hundred. Only I do not like the fashion of your garments. You say they're Persian, but let them be changed. Now, good my lord. Lie here and rest a while. Mm. Mm. Well, make no noise. Make no noise. Draw the curtains. Mm. Mm. So. <laughs> so. No, we'll go to supper in the morning. <laughs> and I'll go to bed at noon. Where is the king, my master? Here, sir. Trouble him not. His wits are gone. Oh, my pretty friend, take him in thy arms. I have overheard a plot of death upon him. There is a litter ready. Lay him in it and drive towards Dover, friend, where thou shalt find both welcome and protection. Pressed nature sleeps. This rest might yet have balmed thy broken sinews, which, if convenience will not allow, stand in hard cure. Help to bear thy master, thou must not stay behind. Come, come away! <laughs> and we are better seen, bearing our woes. We scarcely think our miseries our foes. You alone suffer. Suffers most of the mind. Leaving free things and happy shows behind. What will happen more tonight? Safe escape the king. Lurk. Lurk. Edmund, keep you our sister company. The revenges we are bound to take upon your traitorous father are not fit for your beholding. Though well we may not pass upon his life without some form of justice, yet our power shall do a curtsy to our wrath, which men may blame but not control. Who's there? The traitor. Ingrateful fox. Tis he. Bind fast his corky arms. What means your graces? A oh, good my friends, consider you are my guests. Do me no foul prey. Bind him, I said. Hard. Hard. Oh, filthy traitor. How merciful ladies you are, I none. To this chair, bind him. Oh, oh thou shalt find. God's tis most ignobly done to pluck me by the beard. So white and such a traitor. <sighs> Oh, naughty lady! These hairs which thou dost ravish from my chin will quicken and accuse thee. I am your host. With robber's hands, my hospitable favours, you should not ruffle thus. What will you do? Come, sir. Hmm? What letters had you late from France? Be simple answer, for we know the truth. And what confederacy had you with the traitors, hmm? late footed in the kingdom? To whose hands you have sent the lunatic king? Speak. I, I, I have a letter. Guessingly set down, which came from one that of a neutral heart and not from one opposed. That's cunning. And false. Hmm? Where have you sent the king? To, to Dover. Wherefore to Dover? Was there a Wherefore to Dover? Let him answer that! I am tied to the stake. I must stand the course. Wherefore to Dover? Because I would not see thy cruel nails tuck out his poor old eyes, nor thy fierce sister in his anointed flesh rash boorish fangs. Oh, but I shall see the winged vengeance overtake such children. See it, shalt thou never. Huh? Huh? Well, hold that chair. Huh? Upon these eyes of thine, I'll set my huh? foot. He did not take to lift the leafy old, give me some help. Ah! One side will mock another, t'other too. If you see vengeance, hold your hand, my lord. 
I have served you ever since I was a child. But better service have I never done you than now to bid you hold. How now, you dog? If you did grow a beard upon your face, I would shake it on this quarrel. What do you mean? My villain. Nay, then. Come on. And take the chance of anger. Give me your sword. A peasant, stand up thus. <laughs> My lord, you have one eye left to see some mischief on him. <laughs> Lest it seem more prevented. Out, vile jelly! Ah! Where is thy luster now? Dark comfort. Where's my son Edmund? Edmund, kindle all the sparks of nature to quit. Our treacherous villain, thou callst upon him that hates thee. It was he that first made the overture of thy treasons to us, who is too good to pity thee. Oh, my folly. Then Edgar was abused. Oh, ye kind gods, forgive me that and prosper him. Go, thrust him out the gate. Let him smell his way to Dover. Oh, now, my lord, how look you? I've received the herd. Follow me, lady. Turn out that eyeless villain and throw this slave upon the dunghill. Tell me, can I bleed apace? Untimely comes this hurt. Give me your arm. I'll never care what wickedness I do if this man come to good. Go thou. I'll fetch some flax and whites of eggs to apply to his bleeding face. Now, oh, heaven help him. Yet better thus, and known to be condemned, and still condemned and flattened, to be worst. The lowest and most dejected thing of fortune stands still in esperance, lives not in fear. The lamentable change is from the best. The worst returns to laughter. Welcome then, thou unsubstantial air that I embrace. The wretch that thou hast blown under the worst owes nothing to thy blasts. Who comes here? My father, poorly led. World, world, oh world. But that thy strange mutations make us hate thee, life would not yield to aid. Bless thee, master. Let a naked fellow. I am a lord. Tis poor mad Tom. I pray good friend be gone. I, I entreat him to leave me. You cannot see your way. I have no way. Therefore want no eyes. I stumbled when I saw. Alack, sir, he's mad. It's the times play. When men lead the blind, I do as I bid thee go. Sarah, naked fellow. Tom's a cold. I cannot daub it further. Come hither, fellow. Yet I must. Ah. Uh. Oh, bless thy sweet eyes, they bleed. Knowest thou the way to Dover? Both style and gate. Horseway and footpath. Oh, bless the good man's son from the foul field. <laughs> five fiends have been in poor Tom at once. Such as Arbody Cut of Lust, Hobbity Dance, Prince of Dumbness, Modo of Murder, Mahu of Stealing, Liberty Jupiter of Mopping and Mowing. Oh, bless thee, Master. Thou know, Dover. Aye, Master. There is a cliff. Thy unbending head looks fearfully in the confined deep. Bring me but to the very brink of it, and I'll relieve the misery thou dost bear with something rich about me. From that place I shall know leading me. Give me thy arm. Uh. Poor Tom shall lead thee thither.
Welcome, my lord. I marvel our my old husband not met us on the way. Now, where's your master? Madam, within. But never man so changed. I told him of the army that had landed. He smiled at it. I told him you were coming. His answer was, the worse. Of Gloucester's treachery and of the loyal service of his son when I informed him. Then he called me sot and told me I had turned the wrong side out. What most he should dislike seems pleasant to him. What like, offensive. Then shall you go no further. It is the cowish terror of his spirit that dares not undertake. He'll not feel wrongs which tie him to an answer. Then may our wishes on the way prove effects. Back, Edmund, to my brother. Hasten his musters and conduct his powers. I must change arms at home and give the distaff into my husband's hands. This trusty servant shall pass between us. Ere long, you are like to hear you dare venture in your own behalf, a mistress's command. Wear this. Spare speech. Decline your head. This kiss, if it durst speak, would stretch thy spirits up into the air. Conceive and fare you well. Yours in the ranks of death. My most dear Gloucester. For the difference of man and man. To thee a woman's services are due. My fool usurps my body. Here comes my lord. I have been worth the whistle. Oh. Goneril, you're not worth the dust which the rude wind blows in your face. I fear your disposition. That nature which contemns its origin cannot be bored and certain in itself. She that herself will sliver and disprout from her material sap, perforce must wither and come to deadly use. No more. The text is foolish. Where's thy drum? France spreads his banners in our noiseless land. With plumed helm thy state begins to threat, whilst thou, a moral fool, sit still and cries, Alack, why does he so? See thyself, devil, proper deformity shows not in the fiend so horrid as in a woman. Oh, marry your manhood, mew. What news? Oh, my good lord, the Duke of Cornwall's dead, slain by his servant, going to put out the other eye of Gloucester. Gloucester's eyes? This letter, madam, craves a speedy answer. It is from your sister. One way I like this well. Cheaping widow, my Gloucester with her, may all the building of my fancy pluck upon my hateful life. Another way the news is not so tart. I'll read an answer. Where was his son when they did take his eyes? Come with my lady hither. He's not here? No, my good lord, I met him back again. No see this wickedness. Oh, my good lord, was he informed against him, and quit the house on purpose that their punishment might have the freer course. Gloucester, I live to thank thee for the love thou showest the king, and to revenge thine eyes. Come hither, friend. Tell me more what thou knowest. But are my brother's powers set forth? Aye, madam. Himself in person there? Oh, madam, with much ado. Your sister is a better soldier. Lord Edmund, speak not with your lord at home. No, madam. Why should she write to Edmund? Might not you transport her purposes by word? I know my sister does not love her husband, of that I'm certain. And at her late being here, she gave strange oyards and most speaking looks to noble Edmund. I know you're of her bosom. I, madam? I speak in understanding. You are, I know it. Therefore, I advise thee, take this note. My lord is dead. Lord Edmund and I have talked, and more convenient is he for my hand than for your lady's. So fare you well. If you do chance to hear of that blind traitor, preferment falls on him that cuts him off. Would that I could meet him, madam. I would show what party I do follow. Very you well. When shall we come to the top of that same hill? To climb up it now. Look how we labor. He thinks the ground is even. Horrible steep. Hark! Huh? Do you hear the sea? 
No. Truly. Why then, your other senses go imperfect by your eyes' anguish. So may it be indeed. Huh. He thinks thy voice is altered, and thou speakst in better phrase and matter than thou didst. You are much deceived. In nothing am I changed, but in my garments. Uh, he thinks thou art better spoke. Come on, sir. Uh. Here is the place. Stand still. How fearful it is it is to cast one's eyes so low. The crows and shutters that wing the midway air seem scarce so gross as beetles. Halfway down hangs one that gathers samphire, dreadful train. Methinks he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice. And yon tall anchoring bark diminished to her cock. Her cock, a boy, almost too small for sight. The murmuring surge that on the unnumbered idle pebbles chafes cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more. As my brain turn, and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Set me where you stand. Give me your arm. Ha! Ah! Now, within a foot of the extreme verge, for all beneath the moon would not I leap upright. Let go my hand. Go further off. Bid me farewell and let me hear thee going. Now fare thee well, good sir. Oh, my heart. Why I do trifle thus with his despair is done to cure it. O oh, ye mighty gods, this world I do renounce, and in thy sight shake patiently my great affliction of. If Edgar live, oh, bless him. Now, fellow, fare thee well, oh, sir. Farewell. And yet I know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life. Life itself yields to the theft. Had he been where he thought, by this had thought been passed. Alive or dead. Oh, you, sir. Friend, hear you, sir. Speak. Thus might he pass indeed. Yet he revives. Mm. What are you, sir? Mm. Why let me die? Hadst thou been aught but gossamer, feathers, air, so many fathom down precipitating, thou hadst shivered like an egg. But thou dost breathe. Hast heavy substance, bleedst mm. not, speakst, art sound. Thy life's a miracle. Mm. Speak yet again. But, but ha have I fallen or no? From the dread summit of yon chalky bourne, look up a height. Mm. The shrill gorged lark so far cannot be seen or heard. Do but look up. Right. I have no eyes. Oh, is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? Give me your arm. Huh? Up. <gasps> so? How is it? Feel you your legs? You stand. Too well, too well. Henceforth I'll bear affliction. Till it do cry out itself enough, enough. Die. Bear free and patient thought. No, oh, they cannot touch me for coining. I am the king himself. Sight piercing uh, sight. Nature's above art in that respect. There's your press money. The fellow handles his bow like a crow keeper. Draw me a clothier's yard. <laughs> look, look, a mouse. <laughs> piece, piece. This piece of toasted cheese will do it. There's my gauntlet. I'll prove it on the giant. Bring up the brown bills. 
Ooh. Well flown, bird. Either clout, either clout. <laughs> Give the word. Sweet Marjorie. Pass. I know that voice. <laughs> Goneril with a white beard. Yes, I do well remember. He stopped the king. I huh? every inch a king. When I do stare and see how the subject quakes. Now pardon that man's life. What was thy cause? Adultery? I shall not die. Die for adultery? No. Oh, the wren goes to it, the small gilded fly does lecher in my sight. Let copulation thrive! Gloucester's bastard son is kinder to his father than my daughter's got between the lawful sheets. <laughs> to it, luxury, pell mell. <laughs> I lack soldiers. Behold yon simpering dame, whose face between her forks presages snow, that minces virtue and does shake the head to hear of pleasure's name. The fitune or the soiled horse goes to it with a more riotous appetite. Down from the waist there centaurs, though women all above. But to the girdle do the gods inherit. Beneath is all the fiends. There's hell. There's darkness. There is the sulfurous pit. Burning, scalding, stench, consumption. <laughs> Give me an ounce of civic good apothecary. Sweeten my imagination. There's money for me. Let me kiss that hand. Oh, let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. Nature. This great world shall so wear out itself to naught. Dost thou know me? I remember thine eyes well oh. enough. <laughs> what? Dost squinny at me? Do thy worst, blind Cupid. I'll not love. <laughs> Read thou this challenge. Mark but the penning of it. <laughs> oh, my little sons, I could not see. I would not take this at report. It is, and my heart breaks. It. <laughs> Read. What, with a case of eyes? Oh, you're there with me. No eyes in your head, no money in your purse. <laughs> mm. yep. Your eyes are in a heavy case, your purse in a light. Mm. Yet you may see how this world goes. I see it. Feeling. What? Not mad? <laughs> Man may see how this world goes with no eyes. Look with thine ears. <laughs> see how yon justice rails on yon simple thief. Hark in thine ear. Uh. Change places and handy dandy, which is the justice, which the thief. <laughs> Thou seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar, and the creature run from the cur. There thou mightst behold the great image of authority, a dog's obeyed in office. Thou rascal beetle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thine own back. Thou hotly hast to use her in that kind for which thou quipst her. <laughs> The usurer hangs the cousin. Through tattered clothes, small vices do appear, robes and furred gowns hide all. Plates in with gold, the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Arm it in rags, a pygmy's straw does pierce it. <laughs> none does offend. None, I say, none. I'll able them. <coughs> Take that of me, my friend. You have the power to seal the accuser's lips. Oh. Well, get thee glass eyes. And like a scurvy politician, seem to see the things thou dost not. <laughs> no, 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 no. Pull off my boots. <coughs> Harder. Harder. <coughs> Matter and impertinency mixed <coughs> reason in man. So. <laughs> so. Uh, so. Oh, if thou wilt weep my fortune, take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. Oh. Thou must be patient. We came crying hither. Thou knowest that when we first do smell the air, we wall and cry. <coughs> I will preach to thee. Mark. Oh, I like the day. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of food. This is a good block. Mm. It were a delicate stratagem to shoe a troop of horse mm. with felt. Mm. <laughs> I'll put it in proof. <laughs> when I've stolen upon these son-in-laws, kill, 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 kill. <laughs> <laughs> 
Dear, yes, lay hands upon him, sir, your most dear daughter. No rescue. What? A prisoner? I am even the most natural fool of fortune. Use me well. You shall have ransom. Let me have surgeons. And cut to the brain. You shall have anything. No seconds. Hmm? All myself. <laughs> Why, this would make a man a man of salt. Use his eyes as garden water pots, eye and laying autumn's dust. I will die bravely. <laughs> like a smug bridegroom. What? <laughs> I will be jovial. <laughs> Come, come. I am a king, masters. Know you that? You are a royal one, and we obey you. Then there's life in it. Come, man, you get it. You'll get it by running. <laughs> a sight most pitiful in the meanest wretch, past speaking of in a king. Thou hast one daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain have brought her to. Hail, gentle sir. Speed you, sir, what you will. Dost thou hear aught of a battle talk? Most sure and vulgar. Everyone hears that which can distinguish sound. But by your favour, how near is the other arm? Near and on speedy foot. The main descry hangs on the hourly thought. I thank you, sir, that's all. Though that the queen on special cause is here, her army is moved on. Thank you, sir. Whoever gentle gods, take my breath from me. Let not my worser spirit tempt me again to die before you please. Well, huh? pray you, father. Now, Sarah, what are you? A most poor man, made tame to fortune's blows. Huh? By the art of known and feeling sorrow, I'm pregnant to good pity. Give me your arm. Uh -huh. I'll lead you to some bite. No, no, no further. A man may rot even here. Rot in uh -huh. ill thoughts again? Men must endure their going hence, even as they're coming hither. Right, Prince, is all. Come on. That's true, too. Thou good Kent, how shall I live and work to match thy goodness? My life will be too short and every measure fail me. To be acknowledged, madam, is all paid. All my reports go with the modest truth. No more, not clipped, but so. Be better suited. These weeds are memories of those worse hours. I prithee put them off. Pardon, dear madam. Yet to be known shortens my maid intent. My boon I make it that you know me not, till time and I think meet. Indeed so, my good lord. How does the king? Madam, sleep still. Oh, you kind gods, cure this great breach in his abused nature. The untuned and jarring senses, oh, wind up of this child-changed father. Pray him, draw near. Dear father, restoration, hang thy medicine on my lips, and let this kiss repair those violent arms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. Kind and dear princess. Had you not been there, father, these white flakes did challenge pity on them. This is a face to be opposed against the warring winds. To stand against the deep, dread, bolted thunder. And the most terrible and nimble stroke of quick cross light. Mm -hmm. To watch poor Purdue with this thin helm. Mine enemy's dog, though he had bit me, should have stood that night against my fire. And was thou fain, poor father, to hovel thee with swine and rogues, forlorn in short and musty straw? Alack, alack.
fact is wonder at thy life and wits at once had not concluded all. Mm-hmm. He wakes, speak to him. Madam, do you? Tis sweetest. How does my royal lord? How fares your majesty? You do me wrong. Take me out of the grave. Thou <coughs> art a soul in bliss. And I am bound upon a wheel of fire. And mine own tears do scald like molten lead. Sir, do you know me? You are a spirit, I know. Where did you die? Stand still. He's scarce awake. Let him alone a while. Where have I been? Where am I? Fair daylight. I'm mightily abused. I should e'en die with pity to see another that. I know not what to say. I will not swear. These are my hands. Let's see. Feel a pinprick. Would I were assured of my condition. Look upon me, sir, and hold your hand in benediction or me. <laughs> no, sir, you must not kneel. Pray do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man, four score and upward. Not an hour more or less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you and know this man. Yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is. All the strength I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, but as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. <laughs> be your tears wet. Yes, Faith, I pray weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me. Your sisters have, as I remember, done me wrong. You have some cause, they have not. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me. Be comforted, good madam. The great rage you see is killed in him. Yet it is danger to make him even know the time he has lost. Desire him to go in. Trouble him no more till further sent me. Will please your highness walk? You must bear with me. Pray you, forget and forgive. <clears throat> I'm old and foolish. <clears throat> if e'er your grace had speech with man so poor, hear me one word. Speak. Before you fight the battle, ope this letter. If you have a victory, let the trumpet sound for him that brought it. Wretched though I seem, I can produce a champion who will prove what is about you there. If you miscarry, your business of the world hath so an end, and machination ceases. Fortune love you. Stay. Till I open the letter. I was forbid it. When time shall serve, let the herald cry, and I'll appear again. Why, fare you well. I will all look thy paper.
Some officers take them away. Good guard, until their greater pleasures first be known that are to censure them. We are not the first who with best meaning have incurred the worst. For thee, oppressed king, I am cast down. Myself could else out frown false fortune's frown. Shall we not see these daughters and these sisters? No, 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 no. Come, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in a cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. And so we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news. And we'll talk with them too, who loses and who wins, who's in, who's out. And take upon us the mystery of things, as if we were God's spies. And we'll wear out in a walled prison packs and sects of the great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Take them away! Upon such sacrifices, my Cordelia, the gods themselves throw incense. Have I caught thee? He that parts us shall bring a brand from heaven. And fire us hence like foxes. Wipe thine eyes. The good years shall devour them, flesh and fell. Uh, they shall make us weep. We'll see them starved first. Come. Come hither, Captain. Hark. Take thou this letter. Go follow them to prison. One step I have advanced thee. If thou dost as this instructs thee, thou dost make thy way to noble fortunes. Thy great employment will not bear question. Either say thou'lt do it, or thrive by other means. I'll do it, my lord. About it, and write happy when thou's done. Mark, I say, instantly, and carry it so as I've set it down. I cannot draw a cart, nor eat dried oats. If it be man's work, I'll do it. Sir, you have shown today your valiant strain, and fortune led you well. You have the captives, which are the opposites of this day's strife. We do require them of you. Uh, sir, I thought it fit to send the old and miserable king to some retention and appointed guard. With him I sent the queen, my reasons all the same. And they are ready tomorrow, or at some further space, to appear. Or you shall hold your session. Sir, by your patience, I hold you but a subject of this war, not as a brother. Edmund, I arrest thee on capital treason. And in thine attaint... This gilded serpent. Gloucester, thou art armed. Let the trumpet sound. If none appear to prove upon thy person thy heinous manifest and many treasons, there is my pledge. Sick. Oh, sick. If not, I'll ne'er trust medicine. There's my exchange. What in the world he is that names me traitor, villain-like he lies, called by the trumpet. He that dares approach on him, on you, who not? I will maintain my truth and honour firmly. My sickness grows upon me. She's not well. Convey her to my tent. Come hither, Herald. Let the trumpet sound. And read out this. Sound trumpet. If any man of quality or degree within the lists of the army, will maintain upon Edmund, supposed Earl of Gloucester, that he is a manifold traitor. Let him appear by the third sound of the trumpet. He is bold in his defense. Sound. Again. Again. Ask him his purposes, why he appears upon this call of the trumpet. What are you? Your name, your quality, and why you answer this present summons? No, my name is lost. By treason's tooth, bare gnawn and canker bit. Yet am I noble as the adversary I come to cope. Which is that adversary? What's he that speaks for Edmund, Earl of Gloucester? Himself? What sayest thou to him? Draw thy sword. That if my speech offend a noble heart, thy arm may do thee justice. Thou art a traitor, false to thy gods, thy brother and thy father, conspirants against this high illustrious prince, and from the extreme upward of thy head to the descent and dust below thy foot, a most toad-spotted traitor. Say thou no, 
This sword, this arm, and my best spirits are bent to prove against thy heart. Where do I speak? For thou liest. Come back do I toss these treasons to thy head, for the hell-hated lie overwhelm thy heart. This sword of mine shall give them instant way where they shall rest forever. Trumpets, speak! laws of war thou wast not bound to answer an unknown opposite. Thou art not vanquished, but cousined and beguiled. Shut your mouth, dear. Or with this paper, I shall stop it. Thou worse than any name, read thine own evil. No tearing, lady. I perceive you know it. Say if I do. The laws are mine and not thine. Who can arraign me for it? Oh, monstrous. Knowst thou this paper? Ask me not what I know. Go after her. She's desperate. Govern her. What you have charged me with, that have I done, and more, much more. The time will bring it out. Tis past, and so am I. But what art thou that hast this fortune on me? If thou art noble, I do forgive thee. Let us exchange charity. I'm no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. If more, the more thou hast wronged me. My name is Edgar, and thy father's son. The gods are just, and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. The dark and vicious place where thee he got cost him his eyes. Thou spoken right, tis true. The wheel is come full circle. I am here. Methought thy very gate did prophesy a royal nobleness. I must embrace thee. Let sorrow split my heart, if ever I did hate thee or thy father. Help! Help! Speak, man. She's dead. Who dead? Speak, man. Your lady, sir, your lady. And her sister by her is poisoned, she confessed. I was contracted to them both. All three now marry in an instant. This judgment of the heavens which makes us tremble touches us not with pity. Here comes Kent. I'm come to bid my king and master I good night. Is he not here? Great thing of us for God. Speak, and where's the king? And where's Cordelia? A pant for life. Some good I mean to do in spite of my known nature. Quickly send. Be brief in it to the castle, for my writ is on the life of Leah and of Cordelia. Nay, send in time. Right. Hastily for thy life! Right. Oh! Tongues and eyes. I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is dead and when one lives. <laughs> She's dead as earth. Lend me a looking glass. If that her breath should mist or stain the stone, why then she lives. Is this the promised end? Oh, image of that horror. Fall and see. But this feather stirs, she lives. If it be so, it is a chance which doth redeem all sorrows that ever I have felt. Oh, my good master. Put thee away. It is noble Kent, your friend. A plague upon you, murderers, traitors all. I might have saved her. Oh, how she's gone forever. Cordelia. Cordelia. Stay a little. Mother, what is thou said? Her voice was ever soft, gentle and low, an excellent thing in woman. I killed the slave that was a hanging thee. Tis true, my lords, he did. Yeah, did I not, fellow? I've known the day with my good biting fortune I would have made him skip. I'm old now. These same crosses spoil me for you. Mine eyes are not of the best, I'll tell you straight. If fortune brag of two she loved and hated, one of them we behold. <laughs> She's a dull sight. <clears throat> You're not Kent. The same, your servant, Kent. Where is your servant, Gaius? <laughs> he, he's a good fellow. I'll tell you straight, he'll strike. And quickly, too. He's dead and rotten. 
No, my good lord. I am the very man. Now, see that straight. But from your first of difference and decay have followed your sad steps. You're welcome, Hiller. Or no man else. All's cheerless, dark, and deadly. Your eldest daughters have foredone themselves and dreadfully are dead. Yeah, so I think. <clears throat> he knows not what he says. In vain is it that we present us to him. Edmund is dead, my lord. That's but a trifle here. My poor fool is hanged. No, no, no life. Why should a horse, a dog, a rat have life? And thou no breath at all. Thou'lt come no more. Never. 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 I pray thee break. You would look up, my lord. Vex not his ghost. Or let him pass. He hates him that would upon the rack of his tough world stretch him out longer. He is gone indeed. The wonder is he hath endured so long. He but usurped his life. Bear them from hence. Our present business is general woe. Friends of my soul, you twain rule in this realm, and the gored states sustain. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me, I must not say no. The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The eldest hath borne most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. 